in the late 90s, I met Brett Easton Ellis. By that time, he had already made a big splash with a couple of books. Less Than Zero came out, I think, before he had even finished college. And it was ultimately turned into a film with Robert Downey Jr. Then in 1991, he published American Psycho, which would become a kind of sensation. His, certainly his most recognized and well-known book. I remember the controversy surrounding its publication. Simon & Schuster, in, at the very end, canceled it, refused to publish it because it was offensively tasteless. And then Vintage Books picked it right up to publish it. And then Norman Mailer, before the book came out, read it in manuscript and published a long, very interesting piece of literary criticism on it in Vanity Fair with big chunks from Brett Easton Ellis's manuscript. And he praised Brett Easton Ellis and he praised the book for being very ambitious. But perhaps cutting it down a notch because it wasn't well written enough, the sentences. And I think that's true about Brett and Easton Ellis. He's the first to admit that he's not really a rewriter. He kind of dumps the prose on the page. Anyway, he was portrayed in the press as being this kind of nihilistic LA writer, drug addled, who hung out with all these cokehead has been actors and actresses in LA. But he was also a literary mentor to a friend of mine from college. And so once in New York, when Brett East and Ellis was in New York, we all got together, the three of us got together for dinner. And it turned out, surprise, surprise, that Brett East and Ellis was the exact opposite of the way he was represented in the press. Just a sweetheart of a guy. In fact, he agreed to read, offered to read, my novel in progress and read it on the plane trip home from to LA and sent back the manuscript to me with notes in the margins, praising some of my dialogue, but I'll never forget this, on big blocks of expo exposition, he'd write the word iffy, iffy. Great, it certainly was iffy, now looking back. Anyway, during the course of our dinner, we were discussing books, and he mentioned the writer John Fonte, who I'd never heard of, and his book, Ask the Dust, as one of the best books ever written about LA, and praised John Fonte as being one of the clearest, most distinctive, indispensable voices in American literature. So the next day, I think I picked up Ask the Dust and read it. Ask the Dust ends up being about Arturo Bandini, this 20-year-old Italian-American aspiring writer who comes from Denver, Colorado to LA to make it. All right, he arrives with a suitcase filled with the literary magazines, the literary magazine in which his only published story, The Little Dog Laughed, was published. And he imagines handing out signed copies of this literary magazine to his legions of enthusiastic followers in LA. He holds up in this flea bag of a rooming house or hotel in the neighborhood of Bunker Hill in Los Angeles. And it's a high rise that actually goes downhill. The lobby is on the top floor and the stories go down and he lives on one of the lowest floors. And he wanders the streets, broods, fights against writer's block. It's just a masterpiece as far as describing the swings between dreams of grandeur and objectness that very often plague people with an artistic vocation. You know, between self-aggrandizement and self-loathing, he writes these long 20-page letters to his editor, J.C. Hackmuth, who takes off the salutation and signature and sells them as stories. And so Arturo Bandini begins to make a little bit of money. And while he's living this agonized bohemian life in LA, 
he ends up falling in love with this Mexican-American waitress named Camila Lopez. And it is just the most hostile, cruel, petty love filled with stalking and standing each other up and impotence and remorse and side flings and uh, racist insults, but filled with flecks of poetry, as the book says through it, and humor, I would say. Camila Lopez ends up becoming a marijuana junkie. That part's a bit iffy. In the first two-thirds of the book are just flawless. They sing. He really does have a distinctive voice. Mm, the last third of the book, you have to suspend disbelief a bit so that it doesn't, it's not quite to the same level, but I would say she's more like a heroin junkie than a marijuana or ma than a pothead. Mm, but it ends with this just tremendous gesture. The book ends so well. It just extremely insightful about petty racism, the inferiority complexes behind it, about impotence, the fickle and infuriating nature of it, about self-doubt and how an artistic vocation often exacerbates that, about the breakneck roller coaster ride, emotional roller coaster ride that we can often make of life with our unhealthy minds. And it turns out not to be the only book with Arturo Bandini as the protagonist. It's the third book. The first was Wait Until Spring Bandini, which was published in 1936. In the 1938, The Road to the Los Angeles came out. And then the third book, his most recognized, Ask the Dust, came out in 1939, which coincidentally was the year of three other great LA novels, the year they were published, The Grapes of Wrath, by John Steinbeck was published that year. Raymond Chandler's, is it The Big Sleep? I may have that wrong. I'll correct it on the screen if I do. And The Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West. Without a doubt, Ask the Dust stands up to those three books. And the last book in the Bandini Quartet was written in 1982 when John Fonte dictated it to his wife Joyce when he was already blinded and left crippled by mm, diabetes. Turns out that Arturo Bandini is really John Fonte's literary alter ego. John Fonte was born and raised in Denver, Colorado, the son of a hard-drinking, gambling, Italian-American bricklayer and his long-suffering wife. He was raised in a strict Catholic environment, was disparaged and belittled by the Irish Jesuit priests at Regis High School outside of Denver. So he had a chip on his shoulder. He was a very small man, I think just over five feet tall. In an interview with his wife, his, his wife said in an interview how when she met John Fonte, she was confused that he was a great storyteller, but that some things were true and some things were not, and that it was very hard for her to separate what had actually happened to him from what he envisioned had happened to him. And she called his storytelling and his writing a kind of hopped up version of real life. I think that's a great description of his style. I mean, this is a channel, this is a YouTube channel in which I talk about memoir. And I think this in many ways falls into that category. In fact, Janet Maslin, when she reviewed in the Times the John Fonte Reader, called his writing furiously egocentric. The books in this Bandini Quartet. There's also a great documentary. I'll put a link to it at the end of this video called A Sad Flower in the Sand, which is how Fonte described LA and Ask the Dust. And it's a it's a documentary made with kind of B-roll of old Los Angeles, Los Angeles with this soundtrack of moody jazz, an original soundtrack, very beautiful, interspersed with people reading excerpts from the Bandini Quartet. Um, 
and uh, it has wonderful interviews with his wife, two of his sons, Stephen Cooper, his biographer, with John Martin, who rescued John Fonte from obscurity after being out of print for 40 years with Black Sparrow Press. And there's also great interviews with a guy named Robert Town, who is a filmmaker and screenwriter. He became or won an Oscar for his screenplay to Roman Polanski's great film Chinatown with Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway. And in the researching of that script, he came across Ask the Dusk because he was so he wanted to know how people talked in 1930s Los Angeles, and he was so struck by the book that he dreamed of coming out or making a film called Ask the Dust, which he end, ended up doing in 2006 with Colin Farrell and Selma Hayek. Now, maybe it's a great film. I don't know. But if the trailer is any indication, I wouldn't recommend it. Check out the trailer. But the trailer comes across as being this kind of... or comes across as being the film about these two beautiful down and out characters in this period piece about old LA these two characters who risk it all for interracial love and that just is not the spirit of Ask the Dust but nonetheless Robert Town is very very articulate about the book and about John Fonte and about his character he met him he called him combative but he also said that he was filled with pride and injured merit and that it was hilarious that his bitterness was so entertaining to be around that it, that it was nothing but great fun to be around. I mean, that really describes the Bandini Quartet. There's also a great line in the prologue to Ask the Dust written by Charles Bukowski, another one of the great mm, writers that Black Sparrow Press championed. And he called, or he described John Fonte, he, first of all, he calls John Fonte a god, a lifelong influence, and said that the humor and the pain were mixed with superb simplicity. That's it, man. I mean, he's so kind of flagrantly honest about all the things that plague our ego, let's say. I mean, in many ways, he's like the American Dostoevsky, the madcap Dostoevsky of Notes from Underground and Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment, just self-tortured kind of out to console himself and castigate himself by being cruel to others, haunted by Christianity, just can't shake it. You know, it really is Ask the Dust and all the books in the Bandini Quartet. They really are a kind of American classic. Brett Easton Ellis was right when he said it was a clear, distinctive, indispensable voice in American fiction. I think you'll laugh out loud, and I think you'll be enriched by John, Fonte, John Fonte's work. People should read him forever, man. Forever.